Last time we looked at two problems, retroactivity and target selection. Retroactivity can be an issue whether the agency acts by adjudication or by rulemaking. Retroactive application is said to be disfavored in either case, but when an agency has no rulemaking power or would rather change or clarify its policy in an adjudicatory context, after Wyman Gordon, it has no alternative but to apply the new policy to a party, which is to say, retroactively. This does not seem to trouble reviewing courts so much that they are willing to set aside agency action unless fines or penalties are assessed. Target selection invites suspicion of selective enforcement because, well, target selection is selective enforcement. It might seem that complaints of selective enforcement could be avoided altogether by agencies that possess rulemaking power. If only they would rulemake and impose a duty on all competitors or actors in a field, none could complain. But even in that case, rules will be broken and an agency with limited resources has to decide which offender to go after first. It will always be tempting to go after the weakest first. Now we turn to a case that raises a number of issues, which we will have to sort through carefully, Morton versus Ruiz. The agency action challenged in Morton versus Ruiz was the denial of general assistance benefits to a Native American applicant. If we use our imaginations, and hence scattered throughout the opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court, we can reconstruct what the denial letter must have looked like. Dear Mr. Ruiz, we regret to inform you that your application for general assistance benefits must be denied. Your application states that your residence is in the community of Ajo, Arizona. Ajo is not within the boundaries of the Papago Reservation. Eligibility is limited to Indians living on a reservation. 66 Indian Affairs Manual 3.1.4, 1965. You have the right to appeal this decision to the superintendent of the Papago Indian Agency. As we work through this case, keep your eye on that citation to 66 Indian Affairs Manual 3.1.4, 1965. Like the NLRB citation in Wyman Gordon to its earlier Excelsior Underwear decision, its example will make us more cautious about how we cite authority. Ruiz appealed this denial, and the case ultimately was decided by the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the court's opinion is not a model of clarity. Writing for the court, Justice Harry Blackman emphasizes that Prior to the denial of their application, the Ruizes could have believed that their living in Ajo, not on but near the reservation, would not disqualify them for benefits to which they would otherwise be entitled. The court held that the agency could impose an on-the-reservation-only eligibility requirement, but the issue was, quote, whether this has been validly accomplished, end quote. Reading on, it is essential that the legitimate expectations of these needy Indians not be extinguished by what amounts to an unpublished ad hoc determination of the agency that was not promulgated in accordance with its own procedures. Note the emphasis on the agency's duty to follow its own procedures. Mysteriously, the court instantly adds to say nothing of those of the Administrative Procedure Act. To say nothing of the APA requirements? These requirements control where they apply, and the court does speak of them, speak of them but it does so obscurely. Recall our hierarchy of sources of procedural constraints on agency action. The list is in descending order of dignity, and the agency's own procedural regulations are fourth on the list. Is there nothing higher up? This table is one that we have seen before and will return to again. Every process leading to a final disposition in any matter falls within one and only one of the four squares. Where does the agency action challenged by the Ruizes lie? The denial was the issuance of an order, 
but the order on its face relied on the authority of the on-only rule set out in the Indian Affairs Manual. As we shall see later on, formal Section 556-557 procedures were not required in this case, either as to the manual or the denial. But if the agency is enforcing a rule, mustn't it follow Section 553 procedures first in making the rule? Query. Did the court invalidate the on-only requirement on the ground that the agency hadn't followed APA Section 553 notice and comment procedures? The court remarks that the agency had rulemaking power that it could have used to lay down an on-only rule, but did not. Yet the court does not state that the agency's on-only requirement was procedurally defective for failure to use notice and comment rulemaking procedures. But shouldn't the court have? The answer to this is straightforward. Section 553 applies to rulemaking generally, but the APA makes an exception. This section applies except where there is involved a matter relating to agency management or personnel or to public property, loans, grants, benefits, or contracts. A matter relating to benefits is accepted. The Ruizes applied for benefits. The APA did not require the agency to promulgate the on-only requirement by notice and comment procedures, and the agency chose not to. The court is clearly unhappy with what the agency did, but seems to be struggling to locate the right legal peg to hang its hat on. Here's a thought. Suppose we ignore the citation to the Indian Affairs Manual the way the court ignored the citation to Excelsior Underwear in Wyman Gordon. Recall Wyman Gordon. The court upheld the board order, but disapproved of the way the board invoked Excelsior Underwear. If the court were to ignore the citation to the Indian Affairs Manual, wouldn't we be simply looking at another example of agency making policy common law style? Why doesn't the court uphold the on-only requirement on the ground that the agency was developing doctrine in a case-by-case -case fashion as in Chainery 2 and Bell Aerospace? But the court calls it ad hoc rather than case-by-case. -case surely because the agency was not following formal adjudicatory procedures like those in APA Sections 556-557, nor was the agency behaving as if it were a common law court, the way the NLRB does when it adjudicates. Morton v. Ruiz presents a case of informal adjudication, upon which the APA imposes no set procedure. No set procedural format, but the APA does impose constraints. Without quite appreciating the fact, the court cited a perfectly apt and adequate APA ground for setting aside the agency action. APA Section 552 provides, Each agency shall currently publish in the Federal Register for the guidance of the public rules of procedure. The court makes the point that the agency had not published the Indian Affairs Manual even though the manual itself stated that it should be published. As we will see in a moment, agencies are said to be required to follow their own procedural rules. But what hurts the Ruiz's case is the on-only rule, which is not procedural. We read on. Substantive rules of general applicability and statements of general policy or interpretations of general applicability. The Ruizes were denied benefits because of the application of a substantive rule of general applicability, the on-only rule. It is supposed to be published in the Federal Register, but was not. So what? Except to the extent that a person has actual and timely notice, a person may not be required to resort to or be adversely affected by a matter required to be published in the Federal Register and not so published. The Ruizes are adversely affected by a substantive rule, the on-only rule, that could not be applied to them unless it was in the Federal Register, the APA says so, 
and it was not so published. Note that one can easily be adversely affected by a denial even though one had not relied on receiving a benefit. Next case. But first, let's update our big picture. APA Section 552 joins Section 555 as a source of constraint upon informal adjudication. Our big picture map could have led the Morton v. Ruiz court straight there without detours. In a note following the Ruiz opinion, our casebook editors pose an interesting question. Quote, the Ruiz court noted that the BIA's action violated the requirement in its own manual that statements affecting eligibility be published. Must agencies follow internal procedural guidelines? Is this an independent ground for the Ruiz's court's decision? Should it be? End of quote. Let's take a look at the doctrine the editors are referring to. It is sometimes called the Accardi Doctrine, after a case of that style. And some call it the Arizona Grocery Doctrine, after another case. We will call it the Accardi Doctrine because our editors do. The doctrine kicks in when two things are present in a case. One, an agency has adopted a procedural rule on its own, not under compulsion of the APA or statute or the Constitution, and two, the agency departs from its own rule to the detriment of a non-agency party. Seems simple enough, but a CARDI is not an APA rule, nor is it an agency rule. It is a judge-made rule, and as such is at the bottom of our totem pole of sources of procedural constraint. The Judicial Common Law of Agency Procedure. The Accardi Doctrine. Agencies are bound to follow their internal procedural guidelines if a party has detrimentally relied. Another thing about a cardi is that it is in conflict with another doctrine, the Schweikert versus Hansen doctrine, which states that agencies are not stopped by guidelines intended for internal use only, even if a party has detrimentally relied. Let's, let's set Schweiker versus Hansen aside and pursue the casebook editor's question. Set aside APA section 552 also. Would a Cardi have helped the Ruizes? Had the agency followed the Indian Affairs Manual, it would have published its on-only requirement in the Federal Register. Had the Ruizes relied on not finding an on-only requirement in the Federal Register? This seems unlikely. The Ruizes had lived in Ajo, off but near the reservation, for 27 years. The nearest town on the reservation was many miles away. We're in the Sonora Desert now. From the Phelps Dodge Copper Pit in Ajo, the nearest town on the reservation is called why? Yes. Why? Here is downtown Why. By car, it is 10.6 miles, or 11 minutes, to Ajo from Why. If we want to urge the Accardi Doctrine as an argument for the Ruizes, don't we have to persuade the court to answer this question? In moving to Ajo, did the Ruizes detrimentally rely in the affirmative? Fortunately, APA Section 552 makes this unnecessary.